Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Cervera, and I am the program manager for California Lawyers for the Arts San Diego. Myself, along with Sara Gonzalez, who is the co-organizer for this event, along with members of our statewide staff, including our executive director, Alma Robinson, and our deputy director, Gloria Ruiz Oster, are happy to welcome you to our third annual binational symposium, Intersections, Art and Law at the Border. Each year, we invite artists, activists, lawyers, scholars, and researchers to contribute their unique perspectives and expertise on various border topics. With a focus on issues affecting the geopolitical context of Tijuana, San Diego, and beyond. I greet you today as a visitor residing on the occupied lands and ancestral territories of the Kumeyaay Nation, past, present, and future. As we begin our conversation today, it is important to note that the Kumeyaay territory, also known as the San Diego Tijuana region, extends across the current US-Mexico border along the Pacific Ocean from Oceanside, California to San Vicente, Mexico, and extends to the east from the Salton Sea to the Laguna Salada, including places now called Tijuana, Tecate, Mexicali, San Diego, and Escondido. The indigenous peoples of this land have always been and continue to be our examples of how to be in relationship with one another to both human and non-human beings that occupy and visit these territories. As a guest and visitor and a person who occupies a place in these lands, I extend my respects and gratitude to the many indigenous peoples who reside here and call these lands their home. Once again, thank you for being here and I look forward to the collective conversation we will embark on together today. I'd like to take a moment to give a special thank you to our sponsors for this year's event. And these include the firms of Haight, Brown and Bone Steel, Paul Hastings, Shepard Mullen and Kahana Field. We are very grateful for your contribution and helping to make this year's event possible. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with California Lawyers for the Arts, we are a statewide nonprofit organization serving the arts community, providing legal support in a number of ways. To tell you a bit more about our services and organizational history, I'd like to play a short video from our executive director, Alma Robinson, which will be followed by a welcome video from Jonathan Gless, who is the director of cultural affairs for the city of San Diego. Welcome, and we will begin our presentation shortly. Hello, my name is Alma Robinson, and I am the executive director of California Lawyers for the Arts. CLA is a statewide nonprofit organization that was founded in 1974 to serve artists and arts organizations of all disciplines with advocacy as well as services that provide support with legal and business issues. With staffed offices in San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego, we provide several core services. First, we provide legal counseling to specialized attorneys who provide assistance with a variety of intellectual property questions, as well as contract reviews and negotiations and other important business issues. Depending on the client's financial status, legal assistance may be available on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. We also provide a specialized program that assists independent inventors and small startups with their patent applications. To help with situations involving disputes, we provide a range of alternative services, including negotiations counseling, mediation, and arbitration that can avoid the expense and hassle of going to court. Finally, we offer a full menu of educational programs that include workshops, symposia, and conferences on various legal topics for artists and arts organizations. Many of these programs are posted on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to use these tools to educate yourself on the legal issues before you reach out for specialized assistance from our organization. Thank you for joining today's program, and please consider joining CLA on our website at www.calawyersforthearts.org so that we can continue to maintain our full range of services. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Gloss. I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs for the City of San Diego. And I have the great honor of welcoming you to Intersections 2021. First, if you are joining us from San Diego, it's great to see you virtually here again. 
And if you're joining us from Hong Kong, Europe, South America, elsewhere in North America, welcome to San Diego. And we look forward to having you here in San Diego in person next year. If you're not familiar with San Diego, we are a wholly unique place in that we share with the city of Tijuana the privilege of residing on the lands of the Kumeyaay Nation, who were here well before the state of California, the United States, Baja California, Mexico. We take that privilege seriously and we honor and thank the Kumeyaay for the privilege of being on this land. We also, in the city of Tijuana and the city of San Diego, work very closely together because we know that we're economically connected. But more importantly, we are culturally connected. We often say that we are one city in two countries. Sometimes we'll say we are siblings who sometimes get, get along and sometimes we don't. But in the big picture of things, we work very closely together to advance this special region into its future that only looks brighter. I want to thank California Lawyers for the Arts for producing intersections, and actually I should say conceptualizing and producing intersections. Not only does it provide an opportunity for us to thoughtfully bring together academics and other thought leaders, on the ground community leaders, scientists, and artists and creatives of all types to really consider this border region, how it benefits us, how it challenges us, and how it can only be better. Intersections has also been an a opportunity to elevate this unique place and have discussions among similar border regions across the world. We only learn and improve from each other's successes and each other's failures. So I want to thank California Lawyers for the Arts for their insight into making this truly an international initiative. So I want to close by thanking California Lawyers for the Arts again. And I want to welcome all of you who are calling in from all over the world to this beautiful region called San Diego, Tijuana, Baja, California. We love it here, and we know you will as well. Take good care, and I look forward to crossing paths soon. Once again, thank you all for joining us this evening. This is the fourth and final installment of our symposium, Intersections, Art and Law at the Border. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel today, our event, Mediterranean Migrations, the question of citizenship and belonging. This panel will examine the racial politics of migration in the context of Europe, with a particular focus on Italy and the Mediterranean. Through both scholarly and artistic practice, panelists will illuminate the ways in which citizenship has emerged as a key terrain of struggle over racial nationalism in Italy and other parts of Europe. Our speakers this evening will be Pasquale Verdicchio, who is a professor at UC San Diego and will serve as our panel moderator, and also Dagmawi Yimmer, who is an amazing filmmaker and artist that will join us this evening as well. I'd like to introduce Pasquale Verdicho, who has taught literature, film, cultural studies, and environmental literature in the Department of Literature at the University of California, San Diego since 1986. And more recently, he was the director of the UC Study Center in Bologna from 2017 to 2020. Thank you, Professor. It's our honor to have you here with us today. Hey, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, the California Lawyers for the Arts and, of course, Diana Cervera and Sara Gonzalez for having set up this meeting. I'm going to present you with a little background to these issues from the type of work that I have done over the years regarding the Mediterranean. I have put together a little presentation that I actually put together for a film presentation, but I've altered some things 
in order to present it today. And I hope it clarifies some aspects of what we are going to be discussing. I uh, hope later on with questions from you and through Doug Maui Emer's presentation and film. So just uh, uh, as an introduction to Italy's place in the Mediterranean, this is an old fresco from Etruscan times. It's, it's been called the diver. And it sort of reflects that relationship of the, that peninsula to the Mediterranean, the sea in between, as the Romans and ancient the ancients called it. Now, migration in Italy has, uh, of course, like everywhere else, migration has always been present. Going back to ancient times, the Mediterranean uh, was a place of migration in Italy. It's geopolitical position, of course, it was a crossroads in the Mediterranean. Many cultures, civilizations moved through there. And of course, as you know, in history, also the Roman, their expansive empire touched the known world in many different ways, positive and negative in many, many ways. But it's just to say that the peninsula has been that place. One of the first instances that really brought uh, immigration to the fore was the fall of the Albanian government in the early 90s. Um, and what happened at that point, as you see in the top right, shipload of uh, individuals arriving from across the Adriatic and landing in, uh, in Puglia, the region of Puglia, which found itself completely unprepared to receive tens of thousands of uh, arrivals, refugees, immigrants. Uh, that sort of began a roll toward a negative appreciation of, uh, of uh, what uh, immigration might mean. The photograph on the left of that, to contrast it, to contrast the negative aspects and negative uh, discourse that developed on immigration in Italy, the left contrasts by, because that's a shipload of Italians arriving in the early 1900s at, in the port of New York. So my interest in Mediterranean migrations beyond the obvious humanitarian, social, political aspects also has to do with my own history and my family's history of immigration. You would assume that a country that has uh, over a hundred and so years exported uh, over 26 million people to different parts of the world would be appreciative of what the conditions of immigration entail and would be more welcoming of immigrants. But of course, that's not always the case. And so, Again, beginning with Albania and moving these other uh, photos represent the more recent uh, arrivals from across uh, the North African coast to Italy. And the ones on the bottom, the photograph, uh, are photos of the uh, now tens of thousands of people who have perished in their attempt to make that crossing. Not all of them wash ashore, some are lost at sea forever, but scenes like this have become all too common, unfortunately. Going back to how Italians have uh, perceived race, Italy was, uh, was very much at the forefront of, uh, of the eugenics and uh, research, so-called research, uh, positivist uh, anthropologist research into the meaning, the construction of race. So back in the early, in the 1800s, when Italy was about to become a nation, um, those distinctions were used to define a more Aryan north to what was called an Africanized south on the peninsula itself. As time moved on, of course, with the onset of fascism in the 1920s, a, a regime that lasted uh, 20 years, those race laws, not those race distinctions began to be applied to 
beyond the shores of Italy. And when Italy moved into the Horn of Africa in 1935-36, then those designations were readily applied uh, in order to define the difference between supposedly superior fascist race and the inferior races that they were colonizing, excusing the colonial advent of a fascist regime. Those laws, I should say, in 1938, when Italy allied, Italy allied with, with Nazi Germany in 36, and in 1938, it passed race laws that then proceeded to exclude Jewish Italians from participation in any institutions. And uh, many of them were also interned and, uh, and sent to camps to uh, Germany or Poland. So that part of history is also heavily on the shoulders of, uh, of Italians. These are some uh, political posters from the Northern League, what was then the Northern League in the early 90s and now has turned into a national party. At the time when the League emerged, it was both an anti-Southern and anti-immigrant political party. In the recent years, it's uh, with the increase of uh, arrivals from other shores, uh, the League has been able to manipulate uh, that rhetoric to get even more Italians from the South as well to support it. And now in the last, uh, in the last polls, the League is, uh, has the most uh, uh, percentage points of any other Italian party. So it, it goes along with another right-wing party, Fratelli d'Italia. Those two make up the largest uh, percentage of uh, political entities in Italy at this point, which of course does not bode well for immigration, immigrants, and, uh, and anyone who is not of that uh, state of mind. One of my um, main influences in studying these issues of uh, migration, both dealing with Italians going abroad, but also with immigration into, into Italy, is Antonio Gramsci who in this uh, brief quote defines what uh, becomes in the, in the culture of a people, some of the common sense, what we call common sense ideas, which are really based on representational systems that begin to be presented not only in, in media, but also become ingrained in the educational systems. Uh, and so the, these are the received ideas that then go to form a national notion of us and them, we who belong and they who are arriving. Beyond uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, other people that come to mind who have influenced my work are Stuart Hall, uh, Albert Mamie from Algeria, Franz Fanon, French West Indies and, and Gugi Wathiongo from, uh, from Kenya, all individuals who, who consider the role of culture in the creation of interhuman communication and how these are important aspects of how we construct these systems of cultural representation that go to form images like the ones that we saw on the League, on the Northern League's uh, posters, these myths and preconceived notions. Uh, one person I also always uh, like to cite is uh, Edward Said, who worked extensively, especially having to do with the Middle East, but also analyzing how Europe at a certain point in history, uh, after, uh, as we know, the expulsion of the uh, of the uh, Moors from uh, Spain and uh, Italy and uh, the Jews from Spain uh, began to entrench itself and slowly began, begins to isolate itself in that Mediterranean world. These are some images. Uh, the most important one here is this one. Uh, here you see just in the outline of Europe here and Italy in the center and Northern Africa here. And these dots represent deaths, the thousands, 
tens of thousands. I think now we're up to 50,000 deaths in different parts as they uh, make this attempt to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. A major point of arrival in Italy is the island of Lampedusa that is uh, only 50 kilometers from uh, from uh, northern uh, northern Africa. Oh, here we have Said again uh, about the dangers of uh, of defining through these what he calls uh, supreme fictions different peoples, different cultures, different groups, and how these are e easily manipulated to uh, the organization of collective passions. Something that we are have experienced uh, here in. Uh, the US over the last four years, and we're still seeing a lot of it manifest in the day-to-day -to -day politics uh, uh, that we uh, read or, or see. Now, these are, when I started looking into Italian immigration, there wasn't a lot there. I went to the, uh, to the uh, library of uh, colonial enterprise in Rome, uh, which is a lot of holdings. I wanted to do work on the colonial novel as it was conceived by Italians during the fascist uh, period. But I also wanted to look at what immigrants themselves were doing. There wasn't a lot out there. Things started to be published in the 90s. Most of these books that you see uh, were published in the 90s. This one book here, this uh, Black of Puglia, Puglia is a region in southern Italy, is one of the first books that begins to narrate difference within the uh, Italian landscape. And the uh, Antonio Campobasso is the uh, son of a U.S. serviceman and a, a woman from that region of Puglia. And so this begins as one of the few early testimonials regarding diversity, even though I, I knew many uh, black Italians in Naples who were the sons or daughters of servicemen from the Second World War. One of them taught me how to play bass. I'm not very good at it, but uh, so that presence was always Of what, uh, and uh, that started to emerge around this period. This book is from 1980. As I kept searching, more and more books began to come out. And you see some of these, Immigrato, uh, 1990. And some of these are 1992, 93, in the, uh, up to 95. So some of these books uh, slowly, and now there are many, many more which also leads me to something else here, because one of the things that becomes, of course, important when we are looking at the work of immigrant, migrant, refugee writers, is what is their status? When can they become citizens? Okay, I came to the US, I applied for, for a, a visa to come and study, uh, the university applied for a green card for me. And I guess eventually after, even though I've been here 35 years, I never thought of becoming a U.S. citizen, but I guess after five years, you could be, you have the option of becoming an American citizen. If you were born in the U.S., my children, born in the U.S., they automatically become uh, American citizens. That is not the case in Italy. So what happens to these arrivals, immigrants to Italy, or in the case of these two writers, Ijaba Shego and Gabriela Germandi, books on the right, who are born in Italy of uh, foreign parents, foreign, so to speak, parents who have been there one, two, and three generations, but still foreign because the Italian state does not see them as Italian. Being born in Italy, they are not entitled to citizenship. They can apply at the age of 18, but it's not a guarantee that they will be receiving citizenship. So what we have here in the U.S. is you solis. It's your citizenship is based on being born on the soil, in, in, on the land. 
In Italy, it's you sanguinis. So it's a blood-based descendancy type of, uh, of citizenship, which of course excludes mm, all these new arrivals, old arrivals, uh, arrivals of one, two, three generations back who were, do, cannot show that they have Italian blood. There's also a, an interesting contradiction in all this that as a, again, as a political manipulation in the early 90s, it was uh, Italian citizenship was extended to Italians abroad who were of, again, second, third, fourth, even fifth generation, if they could show descendancy. So thousands of Italians who have never gone to Italy, don't speak Italian, don't really know Italian culture, were able to acquire Italian citizenship. An incredible contradiction within, within this context of national identity, national citizenship. So now obviously here, as I say on the bottom here, uh, this work, my work is concentrated mostly on representatives of the African diasporas. And uh, as uh, in many places, of course, immigration arrives from many different parts of the world. So here, this is a very condensed and very focused attention that I, I bring to my uh, work on uh, immigration to Italy. But of course, there's a very large Chinese population. Uh, the, I think Chinese community is the largest. Many, many uh, immigrants from uh, India, from Pakistan, from all over Asia, from uh, South America, a lot of refugees during the dirty wars in, uh, in Chile and in Argentina, for example. And those make up the fabric, the very diverse fabric of Italian immigration that still has not received the proper attention uh, bureaucratically, politically, socially, but is finally, uh, I think it's finally uh, achieving that through the voice of the newer generations that are writing and uh, making film. Uh, these are films, uh, some of the earlier films, uh, 1994. La America is, uh, is, uh, is about the uh, Albanian situation. And these other ones are deal with the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, crossings. And uh, so these are some of the filmmakers uh, who are at work. And of course, I have Doug Maui Emer here is our guest. Doug Maui is a wonderful person. I met him first in, uh, when uh, we invited him and a group from Zalab, Andrea Segre, uh, who's a documentary filmmaker, has made a number of films on migrations and other social issues. And they came to San Diego to present their films. Uh, and then I invited Dagmawi back uh, a few years later and, uh, as, to, to lecture at UCSD. He's a wonderful uh, filmmaker, and uh, I, I like to call him a friend. I can now introduce uh, Dagmawi. So that was a very fast, brief presentation of, of what I have done and some of the background to these issues. Dagbawi was born and grew up in Addis Ababa. He left his country after the 2005 post-election unrest in which hundreds of young people were killed and put in jail. After a long journey across the Libyan desert and the Mediterranean, he came ashore on the island of Lampedusa on the 30th of July, 2006. In Rome, after participating in a video workshop in 2007, he co-authored the film Il Deserto e il Mare, The Desert and the Sea, along with five other migrants. Subsequently, he co-directed the 2008 documentary film Come un uomo sulla terra, Like a Man on Earth. I think that's the film they came to present the first time. Uh, he shot the documentary Cara, Italia, Dear Italy, 2009, and Soltanto il Mare, Nothing but the Sea, 2011, along with several other short films coordinated the collective film project Benvenuti in Italia, Welcome to Italy in 2011, and a documentary titled Va Pensiero, Walking Stories, 
2013. This is what he presented the second time he was here. And if you can get a hold of that, I highly recommend that, uh, that uh, documentary. He directed the film Asmat, uh, Names, in 2015. And uh, he is the co-founder and vice president of the Archivio delle Memorie Migranti, Migrant Memory Archive, which you can access on the internet and it has both an Italian and English version to it. I've, I've used it in my classes, uh, both these last quarters. And he teaches a master course at the University of Venice, Ca Foscari, as well as in schools on visual storytelling and migration and cinema. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Doug Maui. Thank you, Pasqua. I would like to, um, we, are, we are going to show you, I prefer, of course, talking, uh, speaking about what I have uh, planned to present tonight or today here. But I will invite you also to see a short movie that I have done in, uh, in co co collaboration with a, a professor and an anthropologist called Sh Sharham Kosravi, Professor Sharam Kosravi, and uh, an ex-teacher, uh, uh, Salif Buzim, who, is, uh, who used to be a teacher in his country in Burkina Faso in uh, Africa. It's about two stories and uh, the, the, the main point to do this documentary, experimental documentary, was to bring academic knowledge to, to people who might not have access to such kind of thinkings uh, uh, and stories and also studies because most of the know-how about immigration uh, is confined or blocked in academic spheres and a li very little thing goes out to the common people who, who might have no idea of what it means being uh, a migrant or what it means, what, what does waiting, because the title of the film is waiting, what is waiting for the migrant. So the film talks about this uh, word, uh, and it, is a, it was a, a great challenge because bringing, uh, using artistic uh, means to present a lecture is uh, a crazy, idea since the beginning but i think it went good and uh, i hope you would like it and then we will talk about all the content context uh, which the film talks about pour comprendre certaines choses. C'est pourquoi je décide de laisser ça sur papier. Et parce que en te racontant ça dans le 
téléphone. Tout, ça dépasse ton entendement. Mais je sais, un jour, quand tu vas grandir, tu vas prendre ces écrits-là et lire et comprendre encore mieux. Il n'y a aucune vie facile. La vie est un combat. Quel que soit où tu te trouves, Donc mets ça dans ta tête. Ne dis pas que ton papa est en Europe, tout est possible pour toi. Non, toi ton avenir est dans ta main. Je lutte pour que votre avenir soit meilleur. Mon temps n'est pas agréable. Je vais travailler dans le champ de la cueillette de fruits. L'Europe n'est pas l'aile de Rado comme on le pensait. C'est quand tu ne sais pas quelque chose que tu te fais des illusions. Mais la réalité que nous vivons ici est loin d'être être compris par ceux qui sont restés en Afrique. I will tell you the story of belatedness. We migrants, we refugees, we foreigners, we are always seen as delayed people. We arrive to the white time and it is always too late. We arrive to a pre-existing world of meanings, a world already shaped in which a non-white person is not a subject with a history and agency, but only an object fixed as a category and imagined in a different temporality. Thank you so much for that beautiful film, Zagmawi. And I'll leave it to you all to just further dialogue on the film. There was so much. Uh, I, I didn't mention at the, the beginning. Uh, regarding my visit to San Diego and Tijuana. It was a, a very interesting moment in which I have discovered uh, a complete contrast in a, in a few, in a few uh, kilometers distance. Uh, I, 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 it was, it was funny. I, 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 I traveled with a, uh, a refugee document when I, when I came to the U.S. and, and crossing to Mexico was nobody was there. Nobody asked me who, where, where I was heading for. And when I came back from Tijuana, instead, <laughs> that was the, the long queue <laughs> uh, that I have seen that Sharham Kosravi, who, who is also a migrant himself from Iran, uh, now a, Sweden, a Swedish a citizen. And those are the cues that he was talking about uh, in, his, in his lecture. 
and and you can you can see it when you are a migrant you can leave it every time you you are in front of such uh, episodes no matter how um, the visa was okay it was always the the feeling of being at a certain time rejected or someone can uh, uh, can tell you not to go further so these are the the, the sensation of being always in uh, even the power of the passport that we have is much different it's not that everybody can move and what i what i wanted because i am i'm i'm not anymore i don't know um, in the future i will do it but the classic type of documentary making since 2015 I'm, I'm i'm not doing that because i realize especially because i work on migration stories and i and i reflected what is the re why doing documentaries and these are the questions that were that I was asking for a long time, almost six, seven years now, since I have done documentaries of that denounce the politics, the the politics of the frontier, uh, the 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 management of uh, um, migration issue. Uh, I, I have done it with my older films, but few things have changed with those documentaries and they were useful to inform the public but not as much as important to tell about the migrant story without uh, keeping him or her inside this container which is the migration talking about the migrant and the migration without talking about the stories of the migrants is uh, is what my uh, director's friends use um, are are telling me that the issue itself have saturated as a as a production talking about the migration yes it has saturated the way that migration is told the way and the style and what the director is looking for from those migrants or those bodies who arrive in Europe. But I think that the migration or the migrant stories are not yet told. And maybe the second and the third generation, our kids could be able to tell the stories of a, the single individual who reached the European country. So it's what is, what is the point of doing the same uh, documentary every year because the you cannot or the director should not, I think, uh, follow the ongoing politi uh, po political change. Because since we have done uh, in 2008, Like a Man on Earth, which is the first documentary who denounced the European politics on immigration, how Europeans used to uh, finance the Libyan government to, 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 to block the migrants from arriving from North Africa. Nothing has changed. Furthermore, things uh, started to be complicated in these days what we see is worse than what we lived i lived through so the point is to be uh, as um, useful for the society i think uh, people should start to understand that um, those um, migrants who arrive or we who arrive in an, in, in europe could be very much similar to those Italians who used to travel in the 90s, in the, even even uh, till 1970s uh, in, 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 the Euro, in, in France or Swiss or United States. So this is what people should understand the Italian society. From one side, the Italian society has also um, beard the whole 
uh, weight of uh, of migrants in, by by welcoming in because the, the the administration change and the policy and the politics change also so i think i think uh, it is time to talk about stories individual stories do make difference than collective stories some of those early books that i showed from the 90s those were more individual stories venditore um, di elefanti migrato those were more because they were more uh, diaries i guess in a way of their situation as they were living it at the time that then they were not novels right so maybe literature gets there we can call those literature it gets there a little bit before because it's what people are actually doing where filmmaking needs a technology to help it along and so it needs people like you to think about that and, and then and put that make that make that happen in uh, this film like in asmat for example you used a lot of uh, uh, animation w why is that is that uh, a way of uh, offering it in a particular manner that you think works better for the audience that you're trying to reach or why those uh, why that choice of animation before answering your question uh, regarding what you have said on personal stories also it should also evolve those because i liked the, those personal stories diaries of migrants who used who arrived here in the 80s uh, in the 70s and 80s it's a beautiful testimony or a, a beautiful uh, document who, who they left for the for the generation who who did, who doesn't know who that who haven't lived those years in and i think in the actual time the do, the film is about also marketing you know the pro producing you should sell it so people uh, my my documentaries are uh, self uh, financed i have never relied on a, a big firm production who who finance my documentary it's because this is the way that leaves me the freedom to use uh, animation <laughs> otherwise they might not have accepted it uh, and even um, the, the animation on asmat is was necessary because it talks about people 368 people who have died in uh, 2013 the only thing that i have about those moments of those events was the names of the people who died and it was fundamental for me using and also keeping the people not to uh, not to see other footage that are used to see uh, in the past the migrant body itself and leaving the 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 story or hearing the names of the of those people who have died was important for me to to keep the public con concentrate on uh, on what is said and not what we are, we are looking about regarding footage atrocities uh, and the ugly image or very painful image we have seen them we have seen them and could not change uh, it, on has a contrary uh, effect also which people do not react anymore if it was for that the the picture of the little boy who have died at, at the turkish uh, greece border island kurdi would have been sufficient and enough to 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 to, to think about but every year we produce footage, but nothing can change. And on contrary, people get used to them. We used to, to those footage. So it's also a way to uh, get away from using those kind of pictures for the respect also the, of those bodies. How do you see the dignity that migrants are lacking might have? Uh, maybe 
it's the same feeling that I have felt when I arrived in Lampedusa. Barefoot, uh, thirsty. That, that is the, the way that I wouldn't um, prefer so that somebody uh, sees me. Uh, but it, for many people, might, they might not think about how, how humiliating is arriving also in such a way. So these are also the, mo- the moments where you, you lose those dignity that you, uh, you used to have. And the migration itself is uh, in such a way, especially uh, make you lose dignity. And, and I was, uh, uh, I was damning and the, the, all the things that pushed me to, 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 to take this journey. So the dignity is physically, individually, one can feel it. And then there is also the dignity that image should should be careful or directors or filmmakers or photographers should be absolutely be careful because like I have said that I wouldn't have preferred to be seen in such a way, in such a condition. I was filmed the day I was, uh, I arrived in Lampedusa and that film was important because I found it. But uh, if I was not working on documentaries, it would have been embarrassing to me, maybe uh, being filmed in such a condition. After years and years, those footage of my first arrival in Lampedusa became, became very important. Uh, for me as a personal document but at the other on the other side in order to give dignity to the stories or of people uh, we should give them the the power to speak or the the, the possibility to explain not only um, regarding what the migrant have lived but what he or she thinks because many times we are uh, only blocking the migrant, uh, asking the migrant to tell what he lived and not what he thinks about it. And this is also how dignity should be uh, given back, I think, by restitution of the story or uh, being faithful for the for the stories of the people and not only the the body and the image that we take away from that person it's like taking the the spirit of a, of the person without and uh, if i may say that's that's why that maui's work is so important because it gives us insight on how it, it was very moving in seeing the film in which he uh, it's come un uomo sulla terra, no? where you, it shows you arriving, and there's footage here. It was very moving seeing that with him present, uh, because you saw both sides of the person. And of course, his making films gives us insight on how he thinks about that, that situation and puts all of that into perspective for himself and for, for his audience. Uh, so I think this is, it's, yours is an example and those books are an example of that thinking that goes behind uh, being in a place and being displaced and waiting and, and uh, all that whole process that migrants uh, uh, go through. What stories need to be told? Is there any stories you're hoping to work on soon? I'm working, I'm doing some research on a story uh, which is completely different, but at the same time related to the colonial period. Almost nobody knows in Italy Italy, uh, that there were uh, Ethiopians who were um, 
brought here as captives from Ethiopia when Italy occupied e Ethiopia in the in the 30s in, in the 30 1930 and and these people were brought to Napoli and uh, at a certain point the second world war uh, broke up and they in, uh, they 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 escaped from prison from where they were, and they they joined the the partisans who fought uh, against the fascism, and there is a, a a great hero, Ethiopian hero that we know and we used to have on our exercise book in fifth fifth grade. Uh, we used to know about this hero Abdi Saga, uh, and, and but nobody knows him and we know that he was in Italy he evaded uh, a prison and he fought and he won and then he came he came back to Ethiopia and this story nobody knows it and um, I this um, I was looking for for to, to document on this story and I found the only person who wrote race recently during the lockdown who, who wrote uh, a story regarding those partisans who fought against the fascists, those African partisans. So this is what I'm up to now. And in the future, what I wish, what I wish is to bring back, uh, because when I went away from Ethiopia, I was not a filmmaker. I was a law student, second year law student, and never thought about being uh, ending up uh, uh, as a, doc a filmmaker, so uh, life is so amazing. How you how you <laughs> uh, finish end up in such a way. Mm, instead, there was a friend of mine who was a passionate by cinema and who used to talk with me. Who used to go to school, cinema school in Addis Ababa. Unfortunately, he died on the way to Italy. Uh, it's like I am doing what he would have or should would have done when if he was alive now. So this is life, and I want to bring back what I have uh, apprehended or what I have gathered during my immigration and my permanence here in Europe, in Italy, to back to my neighborhood. Uh, back to Ethiopia and giving the instrument and the instrument and the techniques and the storytelling um, method to young kids so that they could uh, use it as a as a way of expression. This is what I plan, mm. and we'll see. Thank you, Dr. Mawir. Thank you, thank for, you for being here. So. <laughs> Buona serata, allora. <laughs> yeah, it was just an honor to have you as part of this conversation. I know uh, there was different panels and most of them focused sort of on the border regions here. But as, as we know, like, like Professor Pascual and I were speaking before the event began in all the different uh, borders in the world, we're all connected. There's a global uh, connection to many communities and many people. And we're so honored that you could share a little bit of your work and your own story with us today. It took a long time for an awareness of uh, the Mediterranean migrations to make it over here. You know, I mean, you never heard about it on the radio. You never saw it on television. Nobody talked about it. And I think it's because of the, of the fear that it paralleled border situation here so closely uh, that, you know, any, any sort of hint of an acceptance of something like that, of showing compassion and empathy toward that situation would have meant that you would have to show it here. <laughs> so yeah. don't talk about it, yeah. <laughs> and, and also I think just being here in San Diego where I know Italy is sort of a, a crossing point for folks that are coming here to the United States. Um, so I hope maybe in future seminars we can continue um, this conversation because there's I think so much more that we could even uh -huh. talk about. Yeah. I have a lot of friends who, who crossed the Mexican border to who did the Sahara and desert and they arrived in Italy from Italy to to the states. It's incredible.
Thank you again, Doug Maui. I know it's late there, so I hope you get no, some rest. Really. really appreciate you taking the time to share I'm already with awake us. now. I have to find <laughs> something to do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Ciao, allora. Buon, buonasera. Saluti alla famiglia. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao.